All right, without further ado, let's uh, get going here. Um, my name is up there, so you don't have to worry about pronouncing it. Everybody calls me Pierre, because uh, nobody can pronounce my last name, including the French. So <laughs> there you have it. So briefly <coughs> tell you where I come from and who I am and so on and so forth. Very briefly, um, I've been a commercial photographer for about 38 years now. Yeah. I hate admitting that, but um, I started in Paris. I went and had a studio in London for 11 years and uh, in Tampa for 23 years or 24 years. So um, I've done a lot of uh, high-end advertising, a lot of catalog work, a lot of industrial work currently, which is what we still do uh, quite happily, very complex um, industrial work that nobody else wants to do. Um, However, nowadays, um, Kathy and I, my wife Kathy, um, specialize and, and have been involved in fine art work as well. So we're one of those people that are kind of transgender, you know. We, we both kind of go into the commercial realm as well as the fine art realm. Um, awards, we have a lot of awards. We have a shelf full of awards which are gathering a lot of dust right now. And we dust once a year, whether it's needed or not. Um, and awards are just that. They're just recognition for, for what we've achieved in the last uh, so many years. <coughs> but that's, that's nothing. Because an award basically means that's what you've done before, not what you're going to do next. And, and that's really what we need to, to, to talk about as well. Education, I have a master's in physics, which I use very regularly, of course, <laughs> not so much. Um, I have a master's in French Lit from the Sorbonne, uh, which is a bed of radical thinking, as you know. And I graduated in 1969, just after the riots. So my degree was easy to obtain at that time. And more recently, I have a master's in fine arts. So I'm all good on education. I don't need any more than I have now. Thank you. Uh, professional association, I was the president of the American Society of Media Photographers for the Greater Florida chapter. We managed to change the name from Central Florida to Greater Florida since we cover from the Pen, you know, Pensacola all the way down to Fort Myers. Central Florida was no longer very applicable. Um, I was a founding member of a UK association called AFAP, which represented photographers at that time against the Printers Union who were hell-bent on making us something else. Uh, current businesses is uh, Pierre Duterte, of course, which is a fine art site. Uh, I do a lot of consulting. Both me and Kathy do <coughs> a lot of consulting one-on-one -on -one with both commercial photographers and fine art photographers at all levels, but generally speaking, uh, emerging photographers or mid-career. Um, I do a lot of mentoring of students. I'm an educator. I have been an educator for 11 years on top of everything else because it's something to do. Uh, and we mentor people at all levels, but particularly at the high level and beginning levels. And Jerry says... So if you're a photographer and you mentor photographers and you teach photographers, do our fine artists in the, in the room have to get up and leave, or is the stuff that you're going to talk about or that you know about relevant to them too? Yes, it's, it's relevant to actually all artists, including painters, um, even sculptures. Uh, the, the business of photography and, and what we're talking about, how to pricing your work, um, is, is, is applicable to all artists. It doesn't matter what your medium is. You know, that, that's irrelevant. Uh, because um, to, to preempt things, Basically, pricing your work is nothing to do with your work per se, except for certain categories. It is all about business. Okay, I have taught the business of photography and the business of art for, for about 12 years. And there is one constant about it that you need to be aware of. And once you know that formula, you can actually price anything from glass artworks to paintings to graphic arts to design to photography to whatever it is that you want to be involved in. Most of my workshops are actually applicable to all visual artists. Okay, um, I'm not involved in, in music per se because I'm tone deaf, 
but that's about it. And all the other forms of visual arts I can speak of uh, and speak about with, with a certain co a measure of confidence, put it that way. Um, I do fine art printing for some artists and quite a few artists nowadays, um, just like Scott does. Um, but I tend to specialize in black and white printing, and that's in digital printing realm. So I know Scott does just an extraordinary, well, sorry, I'm, I'm not calling you Scott. And this is uh, <laughs> Scott's main printer guru here, who's doing a phenomenal job, <coughs> has not broken the printer no. yet. No. Um, we get along just fine. And we get along the, the process of printing, to find out, is not as easy as pressing the print button. It requires an awful lot of knowledge and a lot of research and a lot of uh, technology and so on and so forth. And I'm happy to be in the same kind of level as these guys. And I do, again, mostly black and white. So, uh, Dutel 2, which is a combination of Kathy and myself, um, are our commercial art arm of what we do, but we also do a lot of consulting with commercial photographers. A lot of commercial photographers, however successful they may be, often need um, an outside source to help them see the woods from the, the trees from the forest, so to speak. So we do that there too. And then we own a gallery, online gallery, called UPA Gallery, which stands for United Photographic Artists Gallery, and the business cards are going around here. And if you run out of them, I will send you more. We have thousands of those, okay? So you're good. Um, and I write a lot of blogs, and Kathy writes blogs, and we write articles <coughs> for publications. Uh, we represent uh, nine or ten artists now, and I'm not sure how many. Uh, we curate their work, and we actually consult with each artist that we bring on board to help them with their work, to help them with their... Uh, with their art, and all of the artists are, are pretty amazing. They're from Argentina, France, UK, all over the world now. So, we're busy, okay? We're real busy. Um, I have judged a lot of photo competitions in the past, which is kind of fun, to be honest, uh, and any cool measure of fun and a pain in the rear end, okay? Um, but I also do a lot of curating, of exhibitions and, and photo competitions and, uh, you know, putting things together for organizations. So curating is, is a very uh, recent, it's a recent thing for me, okay? It's, it's probably happened in the last three or four years, I think. Um, it's exciting, it's complex, it's tricky. You have to be very um, neutral. That means to say that you have to understand the work for the worth of the work in very precise terms, uh, without any personal attachment or emotions to it. So I curate a lot of pictures. A lot of them I don't like, personally. It doesn't matter. If they're worth it, then that's all that matters. So that's, that's me, okay? Um, I work with Kathy. We work together. We live together. We're here together um, seven days a week. I think we've, we're sometimes apart for an hour or two when I do a a workshop somewhere um, and so we're an artist couple and we're established and we're doing great and we're happy and uh, life is good all right so let's let's dismiss some of the um, <coughs> the street myths here charge by the inch okay so you do whatever painting or photography and you measure the uh, 8 by 10 and say well th this is how we're gonna charge it this is this is not not something that that is unknown, this is something I've heard from a lot of people in art clubs and whatever, is you measure the price of the work, the size of the work and that's the price, right? Have you heard this before? Measure, you know, charged by the inch. Okay, well, let, let's let, take a look at it, okay? This is uh, an Andreas Gursky <laughs> image, which sold for 4.3 million. It's a C print, which is basically a uh, chemically produced print from a digital file. Um, it is uh, 73 inch by 143 inch. It is a bargain because it only comes out at $412 per square inch. Which also 
can dismiss the idea that bigger is more expensive. Because that doesn't work that way. It doesn't work at, that, at all that way, because now we can look at Edward Steichen with, with a, a, a 2.9 million gum bichromate. Okay, well, gum bichromate is a historical process, handmade. It has colors induced in the print before you... It's basically a black and white print with some color dyes into it. It's 8 by 10 inch, which means it's 80 inches, really. Uh, so it's only 36,000 per square inch. So Andreas Gursky really blew it on that one, really, when you think about the station. This is... Manager. Yeah, no I wife. know. Didn't have you behind. No wife, no Kathy. No Kathy, no Jerry behind it. What this means is, is the idea that you charge by the square inch is a fallacy. Okay? It's a complete fallacy. One of the most expensive pieces of work in the world is in the Salvatore Dali Museum. It is about ye big. It is worth half a billion dollars. Okay? So when, when you think about it, just forget about this I charge by the square inch. The square inch is your production cost. It is not your sale cost. Okay? So let's try to dismiss that one if, if we can. So moving on, look at a person next to you and charge 10% less. I've heard that one a million times, okay? Which now leads me to think that you are now working for Walmart. Because Walmart is very successful at doing this because they do large volume and the lowest production overheads distribution cost. It works for Walmart because they buy millions of units and they beat the vendor down to a pulp okay <clears throat> I went to that place that Walmart is and I've forgotten the name I've, I've tried to block it out of my mind it, it's somewhere in the middle of nowhere okay it's a huge building okay and they, be, they basically try to beat you down on anything okay I mean, they probably try to beat down the local Starbucks on the price of their coffee. I mean, that's what their mentality is. So when you think about, look at the person next to you and charge 10% less, the other problem here is if the person next to you doesn't know what they're doing, then you really don't know what you're doing, okay? And then the person next to you is going to go, ooh, it's 80 bucks, so I'll charge 70. And eventually, you're going to give it away, okay? So... Don't look at the person next to you because they don't necessarily know what they're doing. In fact, I would hazard a guess that a person next to you does not know what they're doing. That's the one thing that you can be sure of. So, let's move on. I don't need to make any money. This is my hobby. I've heard that a thousand times from local clubs. It's my hobby. I don't need to make any money, right? Why do, why do I need to make money? I'm, I, I get Social Security every month. I'm good. You know, I've got retirement. Which means you're going to go and work for Walmart because they're always hiring at the time. Mm -hmm. and you can then become a greeter or you can work for Walmart. Okay? Because you'll run out of money because you're not charging for your work. Therefore, you, you will run out of money. Is photography free? Does anyone here can, can put the argument that it's free? Okay. Well, it is free if you go and, and smash some window somewhere and steal the cameras and that sort of thing. But there are some consequences attached to that. Um, is leaving free? Okay. Did, did you not pay for gas to come here tonight? Is your work free? Is it devoid of effort or value? Did you put no effort and no value into your work? You didn't pay for any of the materials. Your camera is going to last for 100 years. Yeah, right. Digital cameras lasting for 100 years? Not so much. Two years if you're lucky, right? Your software will go out of whack in about six months, and then you'll have to, to do that. And then you, your computer is going to blow up in a puff of smoke in another year or so. So think about it. Your hobby, your hobby... It's actually a very expensive one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So if you don't charge for your work, then, then it, you're just putting all the money out, not getting anything back in, which means you can't keep carrying on your hobby. Because you eventually, unless you're independently wealthy. So if there's anybody in the room that's, you know, very, very wealthy, please raise your hand, okay? Uh, because we have a different business that, that deals with that. You know, it's called kidnapping and something, <laughs> ransom. I'm retired and my house is paid for, so I don't need any further income. I've heard that. And I go, really? Okay, so this, this is your house here. This is, this is a tiny little castle, whatever. Okay, this is my house. It's paid for. It, it is paid for. Okay, there's no problem. Uh, the house, the roof on that house cost $570,000 just for the roof. Okay, the taxes and everything else probably cost about $1.2 So unless you live in a shack somewhere, your house will cost you money. Life costs money. Does that make sense? I, I'm trying to be not um, overly assertive here, but I'm trying to say something that we're in business for the art. Okay, we, we're not giving art away. We, we have to make it pay for itself. Otherwise, you can't carry on making art. Most artists stop making art not because they don't like art or because they run out of ideas or because they, they don't know what to do. They, they stop making it because they run out of money. And that's a grave shame. In my, in my book, it's it's terrible shame that people give up because they run out of money. Why do they run out of money? Like they don't charge enough for their art. They don't charge enough for their art. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the simple fact about it. I'm afraid to ask for money. I've heard that one quite a few times too, right? Oh, I, I can't ask people for money. It's scary. It's scary. Right? And you think these people have problems asking you for money? Yeah. Verizon Wireless, you don't pay them. They cut you off, okay? Tico is even quicker about that. They take the meter out of your house and go, no money, no power. What about the government? Ooh, do they have a problem asking you for money? No, they don't. And if you don't pay them, they put you in jail. Which is an irony because then they have to pay for you to be in jail. But that, that's a different thinking. You know, welcome to America. Cash or credit. Okay. So don't be afraid to ask for money. Everybody else doesn't have a problem to ask for money. Okay. It's, it's simple. It's a simple proposition. When you go to the gas station and you pump gas, right, do you go inside and go, you know, I'd like to pay 50 cents a gallon. See what happens. Just, just try it, please. Just try it when you go home tonight. Because what will happen, you have a, a car with flashing blue lights. They're going <laughs> to come behind you and they're going to haul you to jail. And then the government pays for the rest of it, so... What else do we have here? Oh, I go by my production and framing costs and just add 100%. Jerry will be laughing about that for a while. Okay, so 100% sounds good. Are you good with that? 100% is good. How much does Epson charge for their ink? <laughs> How much, what is the markup on ink on average from Epson? On the big cartridges, it's about 800%. On the big, the big ones. And what do they do? They don't create art. They put ink in your machine. Now, if you have a small printer, you know, with those itsy bitsy little cartridges, what do you think the markup is on it? It's almost 5,000% markup on a small cartridge. 5,000. And I know that from Epson because I asked them. And they, they're quite happy to tell you what their markup is. I say, yeah, we, we sell the machines for nothing, but <laughs> <laughs> the ink, we make lots of money. Thank you very much. So let's see, at, you know, the markup thing. Let, let's dismiss that in people's minds. This is, a, this is a website that tells you the markups for various things, you know. Until you're painting... 
six thousand something, right? Does that work for you? Cutting the lawn. Okay. Valley airport parking. That's the market. House cleaning. That's why we don't do ours, because we can't afford that market. <laughs> Education. Oh, that's that's a bad topic here, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Look look at these markups. We're looking at America here. We're looking at the standard corporate America markups here. Home and family, okay. Purebred versus rescue pub. Oh, interesting. Furniture, 400%. Make your own. You I know Scott casket, does. It doesn't matter. Huh? If you need the casket, it doesn't matter. Right. I mean, it's good. It's good. Food and drink. <laughs> I bet you didn't know that most coffee shops have a 3,000% markup, do you? So when you get your cup of coffee from uh, Starbucks that costs you five bucks, just work out backwards how it costs, really. Healthcare. Oh, that, that's pretty, that, everybody understands healthcare markups, right? These are current figures. These are figures that are three months old. Prozac. Wow. Happy pills are, are almost 5,000% markups. It costs a lot of money to be happy, right? That's why it's great to be an nursing client. Exactly. <laughs> Electronics. Look at this one here. Yeah. HDMI cable. This cable that goes to the projector. It's a very long cable. It costs $250. It costs actually $1.85 to make in China. So what do you think about your 100% market profit here? Does that work for you? No, 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 because everybody else is doing a lot better. Okay. I follow what my local art club leader says. Okay. I'm going to be generous here and say, well, if that person knows about pricing work, good. If that person cannot demonstrate that they have the background to know how to price your artwork, then it's more kind of, um, what's the word? Personal opinion? I was going to use the word gas, but that's okay. So there you go. <clears throat> so how, now that we've dismissed all this, how, what are the factors that are going to affect the pricing of your work? There's, there's several factors here. The main one is down here, cost of doing business. But we, let's look at all the variables here. Can we? You ready for it? Okay. Subject matter, i.e. what you're taking pictures of, if we want to talk about photography. Is it cliche? Is it conceptual? Or is it unique? That's going to make a big difference in, into what your photography is worth, right? Sunset. A typical sunset. It is good. <laughs> it's a beautiful memory picture. It has its own value. I will not denigrate ever cliche pictures or personal pictures. They all have their place. However, now we're talking about pricing art. Do, do you understand the difference here? There's a big difference. So this is a cliche. I don't know who did that. I, I just got it out of Google because you can get everything out of Google nowadays, right? Google knows where you are. Or we can have a sunset by Clyde Butcher. That's one of his most successful prints. We've been lucky to interact with Clyde Butcher for a number of years, um, whether we wanted to or not, actually. But um, Clyde and I just argue. Okay, that's all we do. We visit and we argue. It, it's really fun. And then Kathy talks to Nikki Butcher and they leave us alone which is really a good thing. Do you see the difference? Right? It's one of his most highly successful pictures. Oh, we have flowers, okay? Well, this is your pretty stereotypical flower. I have seen about 10,000 of those. That was last year alone. 
right? <clears throat> or you have flowers by a gentleman called Ron Von Dongen, which is a weird-ass name. I, I understand that. <clears throat> He's a foreigner. So. But he is recognized to be the master of taking flower pictures. Why is he master? Because of his lighting. He does everything in the studio and he creates backgrounds that are unique to every <laughs> single image that he will do of flowers. He's world renowned. Okay? He has beautiful flowers. Stunning flowers. All about form and color and shapes. Okay, so, so, so we can go from there to there. You, you see how we separate from the cliché to the beautiful. Conceptual. This is a, a, an amazing artist, woman artist called Sig Harvey. And she has stunning quality work. And it's all self-portraiture. And it's based upon an intellectual approach of her interaction with life and the environment. Okay, this is... Not cliche, right? Not cliche. Conceptual, Sandy Scotland. Do you know anybody? Anybody know Sandy Scotland? Quite an amazing artist. Thank you. Amazing artist. She builds these enormous sets. Some of them take six months to do for a single picture. Okay. This is really fine art work at its best. Conceptual. David Maisel. What, what do you think this is? Abstract? Peeling paint? It's a high altitude aerial picture of the environmental pollution from mining. So it has multiple <clears throat> applications which are really interesting in the sense that it is not just a beautiful picture that looks like an abstract but it's actually very much involved in the world of pollution and the world of environment okay and then we have Dodo Jinming Chinese artist that does pictures of angry seas stunning Stunning pictures. Analog. Black and white. No digital here. Very, very big time work. Troy Paiva. Absolutely unique style. Because he photographs <coughs> abandoned kind of graveyards of cars and planes and machinery in the desert and he brings sort of very bold light colored light to his subject so he puts flashes and continuous light with with strong gels into the the object and photographs this stuff so he takes junk and makes it into art that's pretty unique right i mean you, None of us go out at night and photograph this. In Florida, you probably get arrested or something. I don't know. Or a gator comes in and bites you. This is Keith Carter. Keith Carter is one of the most renowned photographers, artists, um, educators, writers of this time. He has influenced my work more than anybody else. He does this in and out of focus. His work is extremely expressive. That is to say it's emotional. That is to say that you get a gut reaction from most of his work. It's wonderful. It's extraordinary. He has put, published uh, over 20 books right now. He lives in Texas. It's not his fault. Okay. This is the uniqueness. What about the historical uniqueness of a particular picture? <coughs> this is Robert Kappa, the greatest war photographer ever. It eventually killed him, 
but he was the greatest war photographer ever. This is an iconic image. Totally iconic image. This is during the Spanish Civil War. Even more iconic is the D-Day invasion on the beaches of Normandy. These images are unique. So when you think about price, there's a difference between cliché, unique style, and now historical value. Does that make sense? It's not like D-Day is going to happen tomorrow again. Hopefully. You have uniqueness, so that's contemporary. This is the Obama picture that led to the poster, the Hope poster, which ended up in a major lawsuit because the artist took this image, a copyrighted piece of work, and made this poster, did not give the photographer credit for it, did not ask the photographer for <laughs> permission, <coughs> and ended up in court and lost, as he should. Okay, because stealing people's work is theft. And theft is the same, whether you steal a loaf of bread or an image. What about this image? Do you think it's unique in terms of contemporary value? Absolutely. Right, so this is important. If it's the image of the Twin Towers before the plane, what is the difference of value between the image before and during? Does that make sense? So images carry their own value to a large extent. Something that people don't want to talk about. The longevity of your image. Scott will understand that very well. We both have been studying this for years. Is your image an analog print? Thank you. Is it a color print? Now it is known as a C print. Or is it another color process, a previous color process? That is an important thing. In other words, is it a chemical process or something else? If your image is a black and white silver print, analog print, particularly a fiber-based print, <coughs> what's the longevity of it? Well, th th that's a factor in, in the cell of your print. You've got to think about it. You can have the carbon process. So the carbon process was in a very exotic process, which was really mainly used during the 20s, uh, from the early 1900s onwards. Uh, it has an extreme longevity. In fact, the carbon process is, is supposed <coughs> to be the longest lasting process out there in terms of <coughs> archival quality. But you're going to have historical processes such as the cyanotype, which is the first form of photography, by the way. Okay? It was invented by Sir William Herschel, who was helping the British gentleman called Monsieur Talbot and the cyanotype is called a blueprint it was called a blueprint for many years and, and it's basically be, you know it's blue because the iron iron sulfide used Van Dyke browns gum bichromates platinum printing which I've done a lot of okay it's made with platinum so you can charge a lot more for it I'll show you some examples wet collodion Often nowadays used by Sally Mann and another great artist. Wet collodion is a highly toxic system even nowadays. Uh, it will kill you. Ambrotypes, tintypes, daguerreotypes. The, the new daguerreotype system is actually safe. The old one killed most of the operators. Do you realize the daguerreotype was made with mercury vapor? So you put mercury and you put a lamp underneath and the operator stood on top of it coating the plate. Mercury so vapor. Be more expensive. Hmm? Be more expensive. <laughs> they are very expensive because they're also unique. That's why daguerreotypes have kept their value. Because they're one unique 
and two, everybody who did daguerreotypes died very quickly. <laughs> photographer, photographer. Right now, uh, Florida Museum of Photographic Art has an artist there who has done giant photogravure. <laughs> photogravure is basically when you transfer a photographic image through a plate using um, sulfuric acid to, to, to etch the plate and then you can print it. It's basically a form between photography and, and, and you know, um, printing, put it that way. Photogravure now has revived itself because now you can get uh, polymers with, with much softer acids to do it. I, I don't want to do it, it's way too complex. Okay. What about inkjet printing? What is the difference between G clay and inkjet? It's simple. A G clay is the French word for inkjet. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds worse than It does, like most French things. It, it, quite rightly. So however, G clay really would refer to a type of ink that is much more archival, which is heavier based and, and with less of a color range. Okay. Generally speaking, inkjet really in terms of what we do commercially and we sell nowadays is inkjet. The longevity of an inkjet versus a gicle is equally the same, okay? Unless you read a lot of articles by people who write a lot of things which they know or may not know about, um, Scott and ourselves do inkjet printing. It is gicle, but it's inkjet. Does that make sense? The longevity, and uh, print transfers is another one, where you can take an inkjet and transfer it through an alcohol gel transfer system to a piece of wood or a piece of another piece of material. The longevity is going to be the same as the inkjet. What we do know, what we do know, is a company called Ardenberg has been doing a lot of research over the last probably eight to ten years on the archival quality of inkjets. And they have a lot of stuff and if you go there, it, it, they've, they've gone down the hill a little bit because they don't have quite enough money to, to, to do all that research. And if you look at a particular media and a particular printer, you're going to get a set of numbers. And you have to interpret these numbers, you have to read those numbers in a scientific manner to know which one is the best. There's one thing I can tell you. It doesn't matter any of this stuff. You take your print and put it in the sun for two months. It don't matter what you have. The best silver print ever made. You can take Ansel Adams' best print and put it in the front window. It's going to fade. Does that make sense? However, it will make a certain amount of impact on the price of your work. Because... Traditionally, galleries still think that black and white silver prints is still the way to go, right? Because gallery curators are not necessarily always up with the times, and it, there's a gap between technology and art. Okay, you've got to be aware of that. So think about that. Think how you produce <laughs> your image. Okay? You put it on your, I don't know, Walmart or Staples little low-end printer, how long will it last? Well, probably a lot less than what Scott and Jerry and I and, and us do. So this is, this is something you've got to think about. That's one of the factors. It's a minor factor, but it's still there. So you've got to think about it. So I'll show you some example. This is a platinum print made with a platinum palladium process. It's 12 inch by 12 inch. Right now it's editions of 10 at $1,500. I'll show you the difference, which is right there. If I press it in the right way. And this is an inkjet print on the same printer that, that, that Scott does. This is a 20 by 20 ultra chrome print. Dishes of 20 for 575. Start thinking about these numbers. Okay, it's going to become relevant. So 
Right, but if, if, if that price, if you only would have been the addition of 10 of that one, what would, what would have been the price difference? Could the price would have gone up, right. but it would never go up to that price. Okay. Does that make sense? Because the longevity of a platinum print is, in theory, again, it's in theory, much higher. If I take this print and put it in the sun for two weeks, it's going to be gone. If I take this print here, put it in the sun for two weeks, it's equally going to be gone anyway. Okay. Does the process have something to do with that as well? The process has something to do with it because this is a handmade, handmade, and, and I lose about half of those because, you know, you have to do this kind of in the dark, mm -hmm. like many other things. But you have to do it with brush. You don't exactly know where the edges are. And it's much more complex to do. The temperatures, the chemicals, all have to do with it. So, but there's a perception. It's a perception only. That's what I want to say. And, and the point I'm making here is the perception is that this is going to last longer than one of these. And that's wrong. They're going to last exactly the same amount of time depending on how you display and how you keep it. Does that make sense? It's the same with silk print. However, you will be told by galleries, you'll be told by collectors, certain things. Fiber-based silver print is way better than anything else, right? I mean, educators will tell you that the only thing worth in, in, in life is, is fiber-based silver prints. Clyde Butcher will tell you that the only thing worth in life is fiber-based silver prints. And McDonald's. What? RC prints are, oh, they poo pooed by, by most collectors. Yeah, totally poo pooed. It's plastic. Ooh, nasty. So let's take a look at a, a different processes and, and, and how it affects the price. This is a one off cyanotype. It's 8 inch by 10 inch. It's actually a mistake, but that's okay. Mistakes are good. You can make more money. That's $1,800. It's one. Why? Because the brush strokes in the stuff and, and you do it in complete darkness and I think we had a couple of glasses of wine stuff so so I want to just move on and, and try to explain the different factors 